For those looking to have some sort of persistent cash within that application, Redis is often the first place people look. It's incredibly easy to use. It's considered the fastest caching implementation out there, and it has SDKs in a lot of languages, including Python. It's particularly useful for those that just want a simple key value caching system without having to do something fancy with the database, as well as those looking to have a persistent cache uh, unlike just simple in-memory caches as well, Redis does work in memory, it dumps its cache out onto the disk when it's done. And this means that the cache state persists between startups of your program. Then there have been some dramas surrounding changes in the way that Redis is licensed. I'll talk about that a little more once we get into it, but there are ways around that. And I do show those off in the video as well for those that are concerned about that. Of course, if you like the video, then consider leaving a like to let me know and maybe subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. If you're feeling particularly generous, you can become a member or a patron by using the links in the description below. But with all that out of the way, let's get caching. As I alluded to in the intro, there is currently some dramas going on with Redis and its dual licensing. I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of details about that because that's not what this video is about. But for those that are affected or don't particularly like uh, the new changes with the licensing, there is an open source fork called Reddict, which is what we're actually gonna be using in this video. I just wanted to use it to show how that could be used, um, but also to appease probably a lot of people in the comments that would leave comments about Redis if I didn't do it this way. The installation is pretty much exactly the same, at least if you do it through Docker, which we will be in this video. Uh, but the usage of it is completely identical. Uh, so just to let you know, that's what I'm going to be doing. But this will be perfectly fine for those that just want to use Redis as well. But yeah, to get started, all you need to do is, well, to use Docker, you would use Docker pull. Uh, and then if you wanted to pull down Redis, you would just do Redis like that. If you wanted to pull down Redict, you would use registry.redict.io slash Redict like that. I already have it, so I'm not going to be pulling it down. Uh, but you would do either way. If you want to install it locally, I'll leave you to find the instructions yourself because you know there are many different ways depending on the operating system that you use. And you know Redis and Redict, I think, have slightly different ways of doing things. Um, so I'm not going to be talking about that here. Uh, but I would recommend using Docker anyway, just because it works everywhere. Uh, the actual the database itself is stored in a Docker volume, which just that seems a little bit cleaner to me. It's better for deployments and you know, it's just, it's just better for a few different reasons. But if you don't have Docker or if you don't want Docker, you can install this locally and it works pretty much the same way. To actually run it on Docker, you would just do docker uh, run uh, double dash rm double dash cache, or sorry, uh, double dash name, uh, redict or redis cache. I mean, that's just my name. You can name it whatever you want. We need to expose port 6379 because this is the port that Redis uses. And then we need to provide the name of the image, which will be exactly the same argument you provided to pull. Uh, so if you did uh, Redis like that, you would do that. If you specifically got the Alpine version for security reasons, you'd do that. If you're doing you know, Redict, you would do uh, registry.redict.io slash Redict. If you want to use an Alpine version of Redict, that's also available, should point that out. But if you run that, uh, we can see that uh, I'm, oh, I'm, I might already using this. <laughs> All fixed. Yeah, that was my bad. I'm doing this part of the video again. <laughs> so I've actually done the rest of it, but uh, I left the previous image running because I'm an idiot. So if we just run that, we'll see that we get this nice display. We'll see we have Reddict is starting. It'll give you the version, a few little things. I'll tell you about the configuration files, um, which we don't have at the moment, but I'll talk about that later. And this is pretty much all the logs it will give you. I think the only other logs it will do is errors, unless you can activate some sort of verbose mode. I'm actually not sure. Um, I will quickly, before we move on, I will show you how to start it if you haven't done it over uh, Docker. So we can do Redis. I don't have Redict, but I do have Redis installed locally. If you do Redis-server, then we get this nice little thing here. And if we quit that, then we can see that we have this dump.rdb, and this is the, uh, the persistent file storage. So whenever Redis or Redict shuts down, it will dump this file um, out into whatever directory. If you're doing it in Docker, it will dump it in the Docker volume so you won't see it, uh, but that will be where everything goes. And then when you load it back up, it will load that file and then you'll be good to go. So we can go back to our terminal and we can install the, uh, the Python uh, package that's gonna help us with this. And to do that, we can just do pip install Redis. Like this, I already have it. As you can see, I have version 5.0.1. Is there an upgrade? So there is, there we go, 5.0.3. Then we could do from Redis, import Redis like that. 
Uh, and this Redis object is our client. So to create a client, once I've done uh, the run guard, do -do, uh, we can simply just do Redis equals Redis like that. And my, <laughs> my Codium extension has given us spoilers there. Uh, but this will create the client. You don't actually need it to, uh, to do particularly anything out of the box. There are a number of options. Let's see if I can get the tool tip up. Yeah, so you can set all these options as you want. You can change the port if you didn't want to use 6379 for whatever reason. Uh, I'm not going to deal with any of this because I just want to do some of the more simple stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's the basic idea. And you might actually, what I've done in my plan and what I think I'm going to do here is call this cache. And this means that you could do is when you're setting the cache, you do cache.set. And that's a little bit more explicit about what you want to do. But this is how you would set uh, something in the cache in Redis. So you would have cache.set. You'd set the key, so hello. And then the value, world. Uh, so you don't pass a dictionary or anything. You just pass the key as one argument and the value as another. If we then print cache.get, which is how we get something out of the cache, hello. Uh, like this, we can see that it returns out. And you notice that it returns out in bytes. And this is because the Redis cache always works in bytes. Even if you're passing a string, it will convert it to bytes for you. And the keys are also in bytes too. So that's worth keeping in mind. It is also possible to create caches using integers. So if you want to do cache set five alive like this, and then we can print cache.get5. And I will actually show you real quick that our cache is preserved. Uh, so you can see we're printing it uh, before we're setting it. So world is already there. Um, and then we have, you know, we set the five alive. We get a typing error. I think it doesn't really like it. I think, it, yeah, if you want to use like um, static typing, then you might want to do it as a byte string instead. I think it converts this to a byte string. But, you know, you, you see the idea, you get, you know, cache got to get five and then, you know, the alive is down there. So it's all worked. To delete something out of the cache, all you would need to do is cache.delete. Uh, hello, like that. And if we print, uh, is it, here we go. Uh, and we can see uh, that the key has been deleted. The value has been deleted as well. And when we get it, we don't get an error. We just get none. So if you ever get none out of a get, uh, that means that it doesn't exist in the cache. By default, Redis creates cache keys and values permanently, so it won't actually set a timeout for them. If you do want to set a timeout for them, then what you need to do is use cache.expire. And then you provide a key. So I guess if we get rid of this, um, so we actually, you know, we'll get rid of this, you know, we'll get rid of all this. Just, it's a bit easier to read. Uh, and then if we set our and get move this around as well our hello key to expire in 10 seconds like that um so this is always done in seconds so if you want it to expire for 10 seconds we can do that if we then print uh oh, we know it's already there if we do like uh, uh import time <clears throat> just to kind of show this off and then we do a time dot sleep say for 11 seconds just to make sure it is actually deleted. I realize now I probably shouldn't have done 10 seconds, uh, but we'll see that the the key would have expired by the time it gets there because it's been it's been 10 seconds since. And you can see we get none back here showing that the key is no longer there. You can call expire on a key as many times as you like and it will update it. So if we updated, if we called it again after five seconds, for example, with you know, a 30 second timeout, then that would override the previous one. So the previous one would be deleted and it would now get a, a brand new 30 second timer on that. So you can um, update them as in, you know, when you please. You can also, if you wanna get rid of the, of, the, um, of the expiration timer and just keep it, you can use persist. And this will, um, delete the expire and it will revert the key to the you know the normal default behavior where it stays around forever now because redis stores all of its cache entries as bytes it is possible to store pretty much whatever you want in there you can put an image in a redis cache you can put a music file in the redis cache you can put an entire program you can put the script that you could put redis in the redis cache if you really wanted to 
Um, but this does also mean that you can put pickled objects in the cache. And I will you know, prefix this with an asterisk that you might instead want to do marshalling instead. Uh, I might do a video on marshalling at some point. Uh, but just to kind of you know prove a point, we can do from data classes import data class. And then we can do at data class here. And then if we do class profile, we do the one I always do, which is name equals string. Is it going to age equals int? It's probably not going to get the rest of it. No, I don't think it is. Is it? No. Uh, wasn't sure whether it um, remembered the script before. It's a brand new extension. It's basically free chat GPT. Interesting. I'm trying it out. Um, so if we do profile equals profile, how many tangents can I go on <laughs> before I finish this example? Uh, sure, that'll work. Uh, and then cache.set. Oh, I also need to uh, import the pickle in here as well. Uh, cache.set, uh, and then uh, my name, why not? And then use pickle.dumps profile. Uh, so if you're not familiar with what pickle is, that will create essentially just a byte string. We well, can print it out for people that aren't sure what it is. Uh, it creates just a byte string of the object, and you can then load it later on. And actually, we can do if value uh, cache.get, uh, and then print... Uh, pickle dot loads value. So what this is doing now is you know checking if the cache entry exists, and if it does, then we load it back in uh, using pickle. For whatever reason, this will always give a typing error because I think Redis has synchronous and asynchronous APIs, and as far as I could tell, there is no way around that at all, um, which is really annoying. So if you are doing a type project, like I have it on at the moment, we have to do type ignore arg dash type like that. But if you then, oh, actually, if I get rid of this, um, <laughs> get rid of that. Pilot scripts, we can see this is what pickle has done to the object. So we just saw, uh, stores it as a series of byte strings. This slash X and then the two digits, uh, the two digits after are a single byte as represented in Python byte strings. Um, so there are some here. And then you get this Z. This is just, you know, happens to be the byte that, you know, maps to Z in ASCII. Uh, yeah, this is the object as bytes. And you can see that we've loaded it back out of the cache and turned it into a data class like it was previously. So that's everything I wanted to talk about with the SDK. I am aware I have been yabbering on a bit, so I'll be quick with the config stuff. But I did want to show you some, some uh, you know, quick config things. If you're using Redis, you would do redis.conf. If you're using Redict, you do redict.conf as your file. And this just exists you know, wherever you can specify it specifically. Um, but yeah, I'm only going to talk about a few config options. Some of the kind of you know, the main ones I think would be particularly useful. So you remember at the start of the video where we had that dump.rdb file after I ran Redis server, you can actually change that file name if you want to. So you can set db file name and then we'll say cache.rdb. And now it will save it as cache.rdb. If you want to save it in a particular directory, you can specify the dir, and then we'll do slash redict, I guess. And now it will uh, save it in redict slash cache.rdb. So if you want to change the behavior behind the file names, then this is how you can go about doing that. The next two I want to show you concern memory. So you can change, I don't actually know what the defaults for these are. Um, I, I might have looked it up at the time, but I've, I've forgotten. So we could do max memory. Uh, as 1024 megabytes and this will mean that Redis or Redict will only be allowed to use one gigabyte of RAM. I think by default it uses far less than that so that will probably serve you quite well. And then you can set a, a, a policy for when the memory runs out. So keys will start getting evicted once the memory has or, or once the memory limit has been exceeded but there are different ways of doing it. Uh, one particular way is all keys dash LRU which essentially turns Redis into an LRU cache. So the most used keys will stick around and the least used keys will be you know, evicted. If you're unsure, LRU stands for least recently used. So the least recently used key will be the one that's evicted first. The final config option I wanna show you is the timeout option. And if we set this to 300, for example, this will mean that Redis or Redict will shut down after five minutes of inactivity. So if you did want to you know, create a cache that did shut down on its own for whatever reason, then you could uh, supply this timeout. It is not 
um, like a, a different way of setting the expiration for the keys. I did look into that and I don't think that actually exists uh, by default, which is really strange. So you might, if you did want to do that, create like a wrapper function around set, um, or maybe, you know, you could do, uh, you could subclass the Redis and have it so it also calls expire when it calls set as well, if you wanted to do something like that. Um, but yeah, that's <laughs> that's getting into more advanced stuff, I think. Let me know in the comments how you plan to use Redis. I really want to know what sort of applications you want to use this for, whether it's just for like a really simple thing or maybe it's this huge Goliath and, you know, this is the start of it all. I want to know, so do let me know. I want to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons and members on screen now, especially Mazard Russian and the third for being so generous. If you want to know what my Visual Studio setup is like, then fear not. I made a video about it last week that you can use and it will be in the description for every video henceforth. So yeah, if you're ever curious, then just look in the description and you'll find the link to that video for the VS Code setup. And I'll see you next Monday for whatever we do next.